Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AccuColor webinar series. I'm Ali Sabir from BenQ. We're honored to have Matt Hill with us today. Matt, welcome. Hi, Ali. How you doing? Thank you for having me. Doing, doing great. Yeah, a, a extreme uh, blast to have you today. Uh, we're going to have uh, Matt Hill, if, if you guys don't know him. He is a partner and educator at National Parks at Night, and he is a, a Calibrite ambassador. Uh, Matt's going to Today he's going to present on night photography, your workflow for post-processing success. Uh, we'll take Q&A. Feel free to send it in the chat. Feel free to send it in uh, the question and answer session. Uh, I think Matt will try to get through a majority of them as we can. If not, we'll save them to the end. Sounds good to me. Welcome, everybody. So excited you're here. Uh, buckle up. It's going to be a big ride. I like seeing all the comments come in about where people are tuning in from. Thanks for letting me know. I see Jay, James from Phoenix, a lot of people from Phoenix. Uh, Leslie from Savannah, great, awesome. Ah, Ian from the Hudson Valley, my neighbor, fantastic. Cool. All right. Ah, okay. So here we are. I guess uh, we're going to begin. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to let, uh, I'm going to banter for a couple of seconds as everybody filters in because uh, we had a lot of registrants for today. Uh, and I want to make sure that when I start that everybody feels like uh, they got a chance to settle in for a second. Hi, my name is Matt Hill. Uh, I am delighted to be here. Uh, and I'm going to spool up my presentation here in a second let me move a window around all right here and there and everywhere got all these wonderful people coming in from everywhere all right here we go all right so uh today we're talking about one of my fault all-time favorite topics which is how I've solved a lot of the technical issues uh, that have allowed me to become a more creative post-processing night photographer. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, so uh, please ask any and every question you want and Ali will jump in if it's something uh, that's very timely. Otherwise, I'll answer all the questions at the end. So let's get in here. So today we're gonna to cover a bunch of things. Um, you can read a lot of this was in the description. So I'm just gonna move on because we have a lot of things to see and you'll see this again. To me, color is really important, not as a technical thing, but for conveying your intent as an artist or as a commercial artist. Uh, and I think photographers talk about color and some people are talking about the science of color and some are talking about it subjectively. But it's really important to understand both of those sides and then decide which is your priority, you know, and knowing when it's color science and when it's personal taste helps a lot to decode some of the complexities involved in this and make it as simple as it is. And it actually is a little bit simple. Why do I choose to engage in color management? Well, there's three words, accuracy, repeatability, and confidence. Those three things are very important to me and they become more important as I use color management more effectively, uh, which I have been doing for over 15 years. Um, it helped me be mindful and really deliberate when I'm choosing settings. And this starts from before the moment I open the shutter. So color management begins on the shoot. It begins in the field. Uh, it helps me make better decisions about lighting and all the way through to the end with post-processing. And I honestly have to say, I the more I learned, the more I felt like I was the one that was in control, you know, rather than trying to fix things that happened afterwards. So my definition of color management, well, really, it's just making sure that you're starting from a place of consistency and accuracy. There's a lot of words you could say, and I'm going to read this to you because they do make sense. Within the photo and video fields, it is often difficult to get prints that match what you see on screen 
and even images that match what you originally captured on the camera. Our brains tell us the colors were different. And there's another trick in there too. Uh, but the primary goal of color management is to achieve a good match across all your devices that have color, you know, which means the colors should be accurate and appear the same on a monitor in the final print or a final output of any kind. So that's what color management is. It is not editing. Why do you need hardware in this process? Well, the hardware is going to make sure that your colors are accurate. And that's both photography and video. Um, but you're going to have consistency throughout your workflow. Our eyes are extraordinary. They adapt quickly to changes in color, contrast, and brightness. But the hardware allows you to measure known values and compare them from what they are to what they should be and adjust them appropriately. That's what the hardware is for. Our eyes cannot do that because our eyes are constantly adjusting. All right, I made it really simple. Here's my daytime color workflow. We're gonna talk about night photography in a second. But when I capture, the first thing I do is just take a picture of a color checker. And I do that every time the light changes or I change a light shaper if I'm using controlled lighting. I put it away and then I make photos. And then I get home. Post-processing, what do I do? I calibrate and profile my displays. Uh, and then I process the color checker camera profiles. And then I apply those presets to the images and I white balance. And then I edit to taste. It's really that simple. The difference when it comes to night photography is that instead of just taking a picture every time the light changes, I photograph a color checker using controlled lighting. So I use an LED source and I do it at three different color temperatures. And if I can do it under starlight or moonlight, if the time permits, meaning the exposure might be kind of long, I do that. Otherwise, I don't really need to do number two. Then I put it away and I make night photography. Now, we'll get to it, but you don't need to bring the color checker on scene. For night photography, you can shoot it separately. Moving on to post-processing, same stuff. Calibrate and profile your displays. Process your color checker camera profiles. And there's the asterisk here. You don't need to do it every time. It will get to that. And then applying the camera profile and sometimes white balance presets to the images, it really depends on the situations. And we'll talk more about that. And then the thing we all love to do, which is to edit to taste in Lightroom Classic or Photoshop or your editor of choice. So let's take the 20,000 foot look of my workflow. During capture, I use a Nikon Z6 II and an H-Alpha modified Nikon Z6. Uh, it wasn't always that way, so I have some pictures from prior to its modification. And I use a Calibrite Color Checker Passport Duo. There are many Color Checker Passports. The one I choose happens to be also good for video because I shoot video too. But this discussion is going to be limited to photography and specifically night photography. For post-processing, I've been using BenQ for over 10 years. I own an SW321C and the new SW272U. Those are the two displays that I have here and my MacBook Pro 16-inch. To wrangle the color on these, I use the Calibrite Display Plus HL. We'll talk about the models in a little bit. And then when I'm teaching, we use the BenQ CH100 projector, and we use the Calibrite colorimeter, again, to wrangle the color on that, to color manage it. During capture, we'll dive in a little bit here. During capture, with both of my cameras, and I have a list of my favorite night photography lenses here, I shoot raw. You have to shoot raw, period. And then for each of my lenses, I would photograph the Calibrate Color Checker Passport using my Luxley Fiddle, which is my LED of choice for night photography. I take one photograph at 3,800 Kelvin, one at 4,200 Kelvin, and one at 5,600 Kelvin for each of my lenses. Now, why would I do that? We'll talk about it more later, but let's say your lenses could have slight color differences. And if you want them to look the same, 
That's a good reason to do this. Let's move on. Number two, you're just gonna import your raw files. And I import them directly to my MacBook Pro, straight into Lightroom Classic. That's my workflow. I copy them as a DNG. Uh, I don't inv import them as the NEF files. I like the DNG format. And I also build the smart previews. There we go. Third thing I do is I calibrate and profile my displays. So for my two BenQ displays, I use BenQ's software, the Palette Master Ultimate, and that pairs up with my Calibrite colorimeter. For my MacBook Pro, I use Calibrite software called Calibrite Profiler, and that pairs up with their colorimeter. And fourth thing I do is I create camera profiles. Now, you can create camera profiles to use in Lightroom Classic or Photoshop. I do both. Uh, when you create them, they're added to the system level of your computer, and both programs have access to the profiles that you create. So we're going to talk about this, but I create one profile that works for everything. It's called a dual illuminant profile, and that combines the 3850 Kelvin and the 5600 Kelvin photographs of the color checker together. But I also create camera profiles for the 3850, the 4200, and the 5600 Kelvin color checker images. And then when it comes to post-processing, I access those camera profiles that are created and I apply them to the image instead of the canned ones. And we're going to talk more about that. And sometimes I use the single illuminate camera profiles, depending on the situation. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Once you do that, you also have the option of applying a white balance if you want to. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then, boom, color management is ended right there. You still engage with color management, but now you begin doing the creative and fun part. Now, this might seem like a tall mountain to climb, but it isn't. Once you've done it once, it's rather simple, uh, and it's easy to maintain after that point. That's all. That's it. Presentation's over. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Let's get into the details. So going back to capture, we're going to dive a little bit deeper now. So I explained that I shoot raw, and I shot every single lens, and I set up my lighting to evenly illuminate the color checker passport. Let's take a look at this. I'm gonna take a small diversion. I just wanna say that there's really no right or wrong, but there's right or wrong for you and for me. I argue with myself about what is right and what's wrong all the time, and that's what we call editing, right? But I wanna stress this. In night photography, it's all make-believe. The real colors of the night appear very ugly to me. And that's if you shot everything at daylight at 5,600 Kelvin. And if you showed people images that are processed at 5,600 Kelvin, they might look at you and say, why did you make those decisions? You say, that's the truth. And they're like, well, I don't like the truth. Make it pretty. And that's why most of us embrace the fiction in night photography. We can use color management to make sure everything is accurate, but we are still embellishing what happened. So we choose colors that are pleasing, and that's where the art comes in. And I say, the colors I choose are my truth. I never say they are the truth, and I just want to get that point out there right now. Now, once you engage in this, you're going to be making your own color decisions, right? From camera to post-processing, there's a lot of options that are offered. And some of these we just accept without questioning them. These decisions are made for us by hardware and software manufacturers. Um, and some of these decisions are very good for you. Not having to think about it is what they should be doing for you. It is a service. You know, you being able to use that product uh, can confidently means that you're moving forward in life and you're doing the things you want to do. But some of these things are recipes and they're they're there so that you can just move forward, right? Let's talk about how it applies to the camera profiles. These recipes that are given to us, when we import a picture, a recipe is applied immediately so it doesn't look flat and like garbage. 
that includes color and contrast and sharpness and saturation and hue adjustments that personally I'd rather make for myself before embarking on an edit. But before doing camera profiles, I didn't do that. So let's talk about these camera recipes within the camera itself before you even get it into Lightroom. It, the camera is trying to make it look pretty for you. So what we need to do is take a look at these, discover them, understand them, and set them to something else. Nikon calls it picture control. Canon calls it picture style. You can see the rest here. What you need to do is go into your camera's menus and find these things and see what they're set to. Understand that they are affecting how JPEGs are written, not raw files. But it does affect how the raw files are presented to you because it's trying to emulate that thing that's selected. So your raw file is rather flat, but it wants to show you something that looks good. So you're like, oh, I made a good decision. I bought the camera, the right camera for me because it looks good, right? But if you have a vivid camera profile on, it's going to be adding contrast and saturation that is not part of that raw file. It's a decision that's sort of made over top of it. So what I'm suggesting to you is right now, go on your camera. Okay, after the presentation, go on your camera, find these picture controls and find the neutral setting and choose that and move forward. Now, every picture that you take is going to look a little bit flatter, a little bit less saturated, perhaps a little darker, who knows? And you're going to have a much more accurate read on what you actually shot instead of something that's trying to please you like an over eager dog. Like, does that look good? Does that look good? Now it's just like, this is, this is the truth. This is a version of the truth, but it's closer to the truth. So, and I'm just going to circle these here so you can see neutral on all three of those. We're going to create camera profiles instead with a color checker. So what is a camera calibration profile? Well, it's a neutral and accurate color profile that you use within your editing software. It's color correct from the starting point, and it's made for your camera and lens combination. Uh, so that means it takes into account everything that happens as the light's passing through that lens and when it hits a sensor and it's interpreted into a file. It takes all that into account and it normalizes it. It's easy. So how do you do it? You photograph a color checker as a RAW file. You export it via software, you apply the profile, and you begin creative editing. It is that simple. The benefits mean that these colors just snap into place. You can see between these two, the colors look different. But when you apply a profile, they're going to look the same, whether you want it to or not, right? Then you can start to say, well, I'm going to make this look a little bit different as an edit, right? But we're going to talk about these recipes next. There's some surprising things for night photographers that you can learn about these camera profiles. Like I said, you can do it at home or you can do it after the shoot. So if you have some night photography that you've made or have been making for years, you could photograph a color checker passport right now and retroactively apply this to images you've already shot and see a difference immediately and then start a fresh edit that may open up your eyes to things you didn't think were possible with those images. So it also has revolutionized my use of an H-Alpha modified camera. I can get natural colors out of that camera without having to play with a lot of sliders. I apply my profile and it looks great. Plus I get those extra pinks and reds and magentas that the H-Alpha is known for. So why do we care about shooting these at night. We're night photographers. Well, sometimes it's hard to focus at night. It's always hard to focus at night, right? The light sources that we use are of more limited spectrum. So it's not full, like the sun has all the colors. Some of the lights that we have at night have less than the full spectrum, right? And things move at night when you're taking a long exposure. So it's just annoying, right? So we're gonna photograph our color checkers under control conditions, and it's easier. I use three different color temperatures for night photography, 3850, 4200, and 5600 Kelvin. So those are the three that I shoot for. And this is my mad scientist laboratory 
over here to the left. This is me setting up to photograph every single lens that I have with a color checker at three different color temperatures. And you can see that I have one luxly on either side, both set to the same uh, intensity and color temperature. I set the camera to 4200. I set the two lights to 4200 and I take a picture. And then I repeat that for 3850 and 5600. For longer lenses, I might have to put it up on a tripod to do that, to fill the frame and get it in focus, right? So you don't have to do all of your lenses. I'm gonna say it again, you don't have to do all your lenses, but you might notice a difference. If you do this and one of your lenses looks a little bit off, you might wanna profile that lens also. We'll just leave it at that. Now that we've photographed the color checkers, let's import our images. Now, I understand that not everyone uses Lightroom. Totally cool. I know a bunch of people that only use Photoshop and Adobe Camera Raw. I prefer Lightroom because of its cataloging capabilities. It's very convenient to me having tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of images to use it. So I do. Uh, you still have this process available to you if you don't use Lightroom, but use other Adobe products. Uh, I'm going to speak specifically about the things that I use. And if you have questions, we can either get you the right answer uh, or provide the answer during this. So when you import your images, you may notice that what you set on your camera is not what comes in. So my camera here was set to 3850, but Lightroom says 3700 Kelvin. Huh. Well, that's weird. The reason is that when your camera takes the picture, it's not actually recording it as Kelvin even if you set it on the camera that way. It's recorded as coordinates, like an XY grid in a color profile. So this is how Lightroom interprets it. 4200 for me is 4050 in Lightroom. And 5600 becomes 5350 in Lightroom. So if you see that, don't be alarmed. Nothing's wrong. Nothing's broken. It's just the way it is. There's a short link here, npan.co slash lrpreview. We wrote a blog post about this. You can learn more about it there at that URL. Um, yeah, it was surprising when I first saw it and I was alarmed, uh, but then I read about it and here we are. I'm not alarmed anymore. Number three, we get to the, the thing that's absolutely necessary and, uh, and everybody should just be doing this. This should be like breathing. You should calibrate and profile your displays. Now let's talk about software for a second. Uh, depending on the display that you have, you might have to use different software. Uh, BenQ makes their own software and they recently released the BenQ Palette Master Ultimate for displays that they made after 2019. Uh, this list right here is what's current on the website at the time you're watching this. If it's a replay, you might want to go check and make sure this list hasn't expanded or changed. But currently, it's the SW272U, the 271C, 270C, the 321C, and the SW240. This software used with a colorimeter is what you're going to use to profile your display. The previous software was called Palette Master Element. Uh, and there's the list of displays you can use it with over there. Why would you use this over what Calibrite provides, the Calibrite profiler? Well, number one, it works faster. Uh, uh, and number two, it's in sync with the hardware that's inside of the display. So it is in your best interest to use BenQ software with BenQ's displays. Uh, and we'll leave it at that. It just, it's just better. Calibrite Profiler is for all other displays and projectors. Great software, and it keeps getting better. Next, you need to choose the right colorimeter. Uh, so currently, Calibrite has three colorimeters, um, and the easiest way to decide between them is the maximum brightness they can handle. There's another thing we'll talk about in a second, but the uh, least complicated one is the display SL that goes up to 1,000 nits, which is a measurement of brightness of a display and then display pro hl which practically will work for practically everybody goes up to 3000 nits and if you work with extremely bright displays then the display plus hl is the one for you my displays 
are this. So I have a 250-nit SW321C, a 400-nit SW272U, and then my MacBook Pro M1 Pro 16 has this insane liquid retina XDR display, which can go up to 1600 nits peak. Because of the technology in that, I have to use the Pro HL or the Plus HL because of that technology. So also my BenQ displays have 100% sRGB. That's easy to achieve, right? 99% Adobe RGB, which is exactly why I chose them in the first place, because of the gigantic color gamut so that I can edit in a huge color space. And then we're going to talk about this a little bit more. The P3 color space, 95% on the 321 and 272 has 99%. So we're talking about big, gigantic billions of colors here. So if you're still confused about which colorimeter to choose on, Calibrite's website, you'll find that they have this helpful chart that you can download that's a PDF, uh, and I'll pop up that right there. I made a short link for you, npan.co slash colorimeters. If you go there, it'll go straight to this PDF, and you can look at it. If you still have questions, reach out to Calibrite. They can walk you through choosing the right one. But here's where the, the rubber meets the road. Is it compatible with third-party cal hardware calibration? There, we're starting with the Pro HL and the Plus HL. And that's where you know you you would need it to, uh, to calibrate your BenQ display. And then what I showed you before, the max luminance measurements are there. So if you need to know more about that, we could talk about it, but we need to move on. So, like I said, the Pro HL is what I need, even though I have the Plus HL because I sometimes do very bright displays. But that's where the technology in my MacBook Pro, it has the mini LED technology uh, and XDR liquid retina displays. That's the beginning of where you need it. And this is the difference between the current crop of colorimeters from Calibrate and the previous crop of colorimeters from X-Rite, uh, where the technology comes from. They produce these colorimeters for Calibrate. Uh, they couldn't handle displays this bright, and it was an issue until Calibrate solved it. So now you can confidently Calibrate and profile those displays. Going back to BenQ displays, let's just talk about what it takes to calibrate a BenQ display. You should let it warm up for 30 to 60 minutes so that it is consistent uh, and it's warm and it's ready to use. It's best to use the DisplayPort cable or second best, USB-C cable, kind of the same thing. HDMI would be a last choice. So if at all possible, use the display port or USB-C cable. Dis disable your screen saver and monitor energy settings and confirm that your screens are not mirrored. I'll show you a screenshot in a second. In settings displays, you wanna click on that BenQ display and set it to either extended display or main display. My 321 is my main display in this three display setup that I have here which I should show you guys. Uh, so I'm just gonna switch my camera so you can see it. And now we'll see that. So I have three displays. So in the middle, my 321, 72U over here, and my MacBook Pro over here. All right, so you can set it to extended display or main display. Also, you should set your working resolution. Not everybody works at 4K. Uh, so you should decide what you need to do there. Uh, I, current, I just changed uh, the prescription on my glasses. So I had to switch it down from 4K to 2K as I get used to my new prescription. Hey, the joys of getting older. Uh, and then you should turn off uh, the HDR option. This is for photography, not for video. All right, back in here. So here's a screenshot of settings, displays, and Mac OS. Uh, sorry, people that use Windows. Uh, I don't use Windows. Uh, these things are kind of similar on Windows, but things are, uh, well, I'll give you this advice. Practically any combination of thing that you want to calibrate and profile, you can visit Art Swansong's channel on YouTube, Art is Right, and he's probably made a video for your specific situation, uh, so check that out. Uh, Mac OS users, come with me, uh, but Windows users, you can definitely benefit from using this too. Where I put a pink box here in going forward, 
is someplace you should pay attention to. So I clicked on the SW272U. I chose extended display. There's me choosing uh, the resolution that I wanted, which was 2048. And I turned off HDR. I turned off the screen saver. So you can see this, it's, it's inactive. Uh, and then I open up the BenQ software, which is Palette Master Ultimate. And I connect the Calibrate colorimeter, which in my case is the Display Plus HL. So once you have Palette Master Ultimate open, uh, it's going to give you two options on the left-hand side. One is uh, which display, if you have more than one there, you can choose from among them. And then below, it's going to ask you to, which, to choose which colorimeter or spectrophotometer you have connected. On the right-hand side, you don't need to change that. It's going to automatically default to color calibration. Those other two options we don't need to worry about now. Then click Start. And now, here's the part where I'm speaking directly to night photographers. Daylight photographers, totally cool. You can edit at 120 candelas per meter. Night photography is often very gentle. It's more about shadows and gentle highlights. So it's better to edit at a lower screen brightness. So I got this recommendation from Calibrate a year or two back and I tried it and I absolutely love it. And I've been doing it going forward. I use a hundred candelas per meter instead of 120. So at this point I would click on edit target and then I would change this to a custom luminance and I would set it to 100 candelas per meter. And then I would click done. So now my screen brightness is going to be dimmer, right? So once you've done that, you confirm it. You can see it here. It says 100 candelas per meter. Down here, you have to choose a calibration mode. You have slots on your BenQ display to quick switch between calibration modes. This is the first slot, calibration one. So we're going to put it in the first slot, uh, and then we're going to click Next. Here it's going to tell you some of the things I told you already about uh, the state your monitor should be in and how it should be connected. You could change the profile name here if you wanted to, but it's not necessary. Uh, it will build a similar profile name every time and change the variables that are different, such as the date. And then you're going to... Uh, See the software prompt you to put the colorimeter on the screen. And then I've sped this up dramatically, uh, but it doesn't take that long versus when I use the Calibrate software and I use the full patch set. So you can see it's doing the calibration now. And at the end of the calibration, it's going to build us a profile. Uh, so it's going through all of the different chroma uh, and brightnesses and then it goes through a validation, which is absolutely wonderful. And it gives you this report at the end that tells you whether it was successful or not. And these green check marks mean, yes, we're in a really good place. So you can click on completed after that. Uh, and then you're done. You've done, you're complete for this display. And that's really wonderful. So we're, we're done with that. You, I would repeat this for my second BenQ display. I'm really grateful that I, I have the wherewithal to own two of them. Uh, it makes my life easy to have that much screen real estate. Um, now we're going to move on to talking about the built-in display in my laptop. Uh, no, I'm going to point out now that things have gotten complicated as these displays have gotten brighter and more capable. So uh, you might have different settings that I'm suggesting than the laptop that I have. So I'm going to talk about what I have, and you might know, identify that there's different things. But let's talk about my situation first, and I can answer questions. Uh, if not, I can get back to you guys later. So in my case, uh, there's a default preset that the laptop ships with. It's calibrated at the factory, uh, and the BenQ displays and the laptops are displayed or calibrated very well at the factory. But everything ages, right? Uh, and the more you use it, the more it stays on, the more it's going to change and drift. And that's what the this uh, calibration and profile is for, is to set it back to normal. So this HDR display comes with a default called Apple HDR display P3 1600 nits. That's very bright. It's a very bright screen. 
Um, so if you're using that default state that the laptop comes in, there's certain things you should turn off under the Apple menu system settings. You need to turn off True Tone, HDR, you need to turn off mirror display mode, night shift, and automatically adjust brightness. Uh, and we'll take a sidebar here. What is display P3? You may be familiar with color gamuts such as um, uh, Adobe RGB, right? Uh, this is a new version of that. It's a it's a color space that matches the capabilities of newer displays. They're getting brighter and they have wider color gamuts plus really amazing HDR abilities. So I said it before, I'll say it again. It's really best to edit in the largest color space you can. And then when you're going to push it out to something else that has a smaller color space, then you convert it so all the colors pop into the right place. On the Benki website, they have this description of it. Display P3 is a wide color gamut used extensively in mobile devices, not just our laptops, uh, mobile phones, tablets, notebooks, and certain late model desktops. So, and Surface Studio and MacBook Pros compared to sRGB, which is a very small color space, but it's used for printing. That's basically what a piece of paper can handle for a color gamut. Display P3 features more richly saturated red and green colors. There you go. So here's the settings for my MacBook Pro. You can see that I have selected the built-in display. I've set it to extended since my BenQ 321 is uh, the main display. I've selected this. I've turned off a brightness, true tone, and I clicked on night shift and I turned it off. It's pretty complicated, right? If you don't like this, there's a fast way around it. You can go into that preset and you can see this is that preset here that's in displays under settings. This is the default. You can instead go down and click on customize presets. And then you can go in here and hit the, you select the P3 D65 photography preset. This one, oops, this one, is set to be uh, 160, 150 candelas per meter instead. You can hit the plus button here and click done, and it's going to pop up a new window where you can now set this to standard definition SD right here, set it to 100. And it's going to checkbox limit luminance to full screen capability. So now what you're doing is you're creating a, you're customizing a preset that's built into the Mac OS that limits it to only 100 candelas per meter. Then you click Save Preset. And now, in System Preferences, under Displays, you just go to Preset and select that preset that you made, which is limited to 100 candelas per meter. And now you can't adjust the brightness of your laptop screen. Uh, that works out really great for me because I often work in only dark situations. If you need to change it, you could just come in here and set it back to the default state uh, and it will be brighter for other situations. But I primarily use this laptop for editing photography. So it's a lot faster way. And now, now that we've done that, we've put our laptop into a state where it's ready to receive a calibration and profile. We're going to go into calibrate profiling. This is the software that Calibrate makes. And as soon as you load it up, it's going to look for a piece of hardware, which is your colorimeter. And if it's plugged in, it's going to show you a green circle down here. It's going to show you which one it is. And also, you would click over here on the thing that you want to profile. In this case, we have a monitor. And we, have, we want to choose Advanced there because there's some other options in here that we want to work with on. In the next screen, very important for MacBook Pro users, white LED, this drop-down menu that's underneath Apple Display, is not correct. The technology is called Mini LED. So you need to hit that drop-down and choose Mini LED, and then click Next. And it'll say, all right, this is Mini LED. You have to match the technology to what you have. Now, you might have another display and say, what is it? You should go to your manufacturer's website and go under the specifications and look at the display and say, match what its technology is to this drop-down menu inside of Calibrate Profiler. 
Uh, if you have questions about that, you can reach out to Calibrite's uh, support team and they will help you uh, make the right decision. Next, to match what we did to the display, limiting it to 100 candelas per meter, we're going to go in here and we're going to click on that. Instead of 120 candelas per meter, we're going to use 100. And you may have to click on custom to unlock that. We're not going to touch anything in this window. Contrast ratio and gamma remain the same. Uh, and then we're going to leave these defaults the same as they are here. The Bradford version 2 ICC profile and profile type, those don't need to change at all. I, however, use the large patch set, the 461 color patch set. It takes a while, but if you're going to take the time to profile, why not do it the best way possible? That's my logic here. So once you get this going, you go get a cup of coffee or make yourself a sandwich, right? You can use the other patches and have great success. The other patch sets and have great success. Uh, this is the way that I do it. And I'm very happy with my workflow. Now, when you get to this next page, you might be really happy to just click on start measurement. But if you don't want to go through selecting all of those things again, click on save preset first and give this preset a name. So I called it Matt 100 Candelas D65 461 patch. And you can put in notes in there too, if you want to. So at the end of this, you can also go down and there's a presets over here that you can click. And then your preset will, the next time you come in here, when you click home and come in, that preset will be available. So you can just select it and move forward. And you saved yourself a bunch of time for the next time you profile. The next screen that comes up, it's going to have a checkbox by brightness. But since we limited our brightness, we're not going to let it. So we uncheck that brightness box there. These other two were not checked, and that's fine. And then you're going to do what you've probably seen, and it is illustrated here before, which is to take out the colorimeter, uh, take the cover off, uh, and flip it over and put it on your display inside that circle. And then you're going to go make a sandwich because it's going to do this. And this is sped up a lot. I think this is at 1800%. Um, it takes a little while. It's 461 patches. Uh, and it's going to go through all of these different chroma and uh, intensities and it's going to measure them against the known values. And it's going to build a table called the lookup table. And it's going to say, all right, I know that it should be this value, but I measured this value. And at the end of it, it's going to show you this wonderful, you can't hover over it and get any values or anything, but each half of the circle is what it measured versus what it, it, it expected to have. So you would just move beyond this. And then you would save the profile. You don't have to change the name here. It should put in everything that you need. Click save. It's going to save the profile to the system level. So the system has access to it. And then if you want to, you can flip between the before and after here. And it's going to show you uh, the benefits of what you did. It's Sometimes it's dramatic. And sometimes if you've done it before, like two weeks or four weeks before, it's going to be very little. So that is the end of profiling your displays. Next, we move on to creating camera profiles. So in Adobe Lightroom Classic, there is a Calibrite Color Checker plugin, which you can download from the Calibrite website. In Adobe Photoshop, the RAW processor is called ACR or Adobe Camera Raw. There's a standalone version of the software we download from the same place the Calibrate Color Checker standalone software. You would use that to choose the raw files and process your DNG, um, uh, raw, your pro camera profiles for access within Photoshop. Now you can do use that standalone software to process profiles that Lightroom can also see, but Lightroom has the plugin that makes it easier. What we're gonna do is we're gonna identify those images that we shot of the color checkers within Lightroom. Uh, and we're going to create one dual illuminant profile uh, from the 3850 and the 5600 color checker images. And they're going to create one each of the 3850, 4200, and 5600. 
here's where you can download the color checker camera calibration software. It's calibrate.com slash US slash photo target. If you're in another country, you might have a different subfolder there uh, when you're prompted to enter the website. Now you can use this software with any of the color checker 24 patch charts. There are many of them. I've been talking about the passport here, but they have lots of other applications and sizes uh, for the color checkers uh, for different kinds of people. So what software is compatible with this? Well, it's for DNG and ICC profiles or ICC profiles only. The whole Adobe Suite, basically, Lightroom 2.0 or newer, Classic or CC, Photoshop, Raw 4.5 or newer, CS3 or newer. So it goes back a ways. Photoshop Elements 7 or newer, and Bridge CS3, right? And then if you use Capture One, it's version 7 or newer, but that's ICC profiles only, not the DNG uh, process that we use here. Now, I like to organize my color checker images. I don't like to keep them with the other images, or I make copies of them. Uh, I make one folder inside of all of my other folders called Color Management. And then I make subfolders for each of those for each camera that I have. So if I need quick access to these profiles, I know exactly where to find them. I don't have to think about which day I shot them on and where I shot them on, because I organize my catalog by geography. So here's an example. We're in my Nikon Z62 folder inside of the color management folder. And I'm going to select two images. One of them is the 3850 image, and the other one is the 5600 Kelvin image. And I'm just going to click on the export button. And this is to show you how easy it is. You can use the drop down at the top of the export window. If once you've installed the software, it says X Write presets. It's a holdover from uh, the transition from X-Rite to Calibrite. Or you can just go over here on the sidebar, expand the X-Rite presets, and click on Color Check Camera Calibration. Now, there's a lot of explaining information here. That's totally fine. But all you really need to do is give this profile a name. And in this case, I called it Nikon Z62, the name of the camera, the Laowa 15 millimeter. that's the lens that I used, and dual illuminate. So that's the color temperature. And then I click export. And then it's going to take a little bit of time, maybe 30 seconds to a minute. And then there's going to be a pop-up that says the profile's been generated. You have to restart Lightroom to activate the profile. That's it. You can now use that profile going forward once you've quit Lightroom and restarted. I'll repeat this for each of the single Illuminate color checker images. A single profile for 3850, a single for 4200, and a single for 5600. And once I've done that, I'm going to go into each image and apply it, and I'm going to create presets. Uh, but we can talk about that a little bit later. I just want to make sure that we uh, leave enough time for everything that we're going to talk about. So these presets I use all the time. They make everything a lot faster. So I end up with four presets for each camera and lens combination. So then you're going to quit and reopen Lightroom Classic, and then you're going to find the camera profiles are available for post-processing. So again, I'm talking about Lightroom Classic or Adobe Photoshop ACR, which has a very similar interface to Lightroom. They're starting to get closer to each other in how they present. Uh, so we're going to apply the dual luminate or a single luminate camera profile, and we're also going to apply some creative edits. So let's stop for a second and talk about post-processing recipes. Um, there are canned profiles from Adobe, and they're great, absolutely wonderful when you're starting out. And there's so many options that you get overwhelmed. There's so many sliders, there's so many things to look at, and you don't know what any of them do. These canned profiles like Adobe Color, Adobe Landscape, Adobe Portrait, are awesome as a springboard, a jumping off point. But those recipes affect your contrast and brightness, but they don't move any of the sliders. So you don't know what they, they actually do. They're just trying to present something that makes you feel good. And like I said, when you're starting out, that's an amazing advantage to have something that gives you a springboard. Um, once you understand what all the sliders do in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw, perhaps you'll want to have more 
control and a neutral starting point. So let's reference these profiles. There's Adobe Color, Monochrome, Landscape, Neutral, Portrait, Standard V2, and Vivid, right? Those are the Adobe Raw camera profiles. And this is what they are applied to the same image. So now you can see that there's some pretty dramatic differences between them, even at a thumbnail size. But let's zoom in and take a look. Adobe Color looks to be about the most natural looking one. Landscape, things get more saturated. The shadows start to clump up. It's got more contrast. Neutral is exactly like it says. It's pretty neutral. Portrait applies some other things. There's no skin tone here, so it's hard to say what it's doing. There's not a lot of reds or uh, flesh tones in here. So in standard V2 and Vivid, Vivid is just makes everything a little bit more crunchy and saturated, right? But now I'm going to introduce a custom camera profile that I had over on the right-hand side. So this is Adobe Color. And here's Adobe Landscape, which I did use a lot of prior to using custom camera profiles. And then this is a custom camera profile. And notice the remarkable difference between them. I did not notice how aqua the sky was until this full moonlight shot, this custom camera profile really revealed it. I would have been correcting the canned camera profile to get rid of that aqua instead of just single click applying a custom camera profile that shows me the right colors from the start. Now think about what a time saver that can be, that you don't need to correct things uh, and you can just start from a place of neutrality. And I hope that the pieces are starting to fall into place now uh, because your display is showing you the right colors, you've calibrated and profiled it, and you're applying a camera profile that's based on science. Now you're starting from a place of confidence and neutrality and here's the Adobe Landscape on the left, which I would have used before I knew about camera profiles. And there's a custom camera profile on the right. And the difference is immediate and dramatic sometimes. Uh, other times, if you have a really neutral scene, you might not see much of a difference, uh, but I often do. So these camera profiles, uh, they emulate things, right? So I don't think they're ideal for night photography. I believe in custom camera profiles now. Uh, here's the ones that Nikon provides. So these, if you look inside of Lightroom, you're probably going to see ones that match the ones on your camera. These are the same thing. These are ones that are trying to give you recipes to make things look uh, instantaneously uh, better, right? Uh, but they're not the same sort of uh, confidence inspiring neutral uh, or correct that a custom camera profile is. So you're gonna create neutral camera profiles if you agree with me. Uh, and there's finally a reason to be using a, a color checker for night photography, which prior to me uh, you know, discussing this with Brenda at X-Ray and then taking her challenge to try the dual illuminate profile, which unlocked it for me. Uh, then I started using them for everything. Let's like take a look at a couple more examples here. Uh, so on the left, we have a 3850 shot and Adobe Standard. And then we have a 3850 plus a custom camera profile. And then I added one more step. I did a custom white balance for the third panel. Let's zoom in a little bit. Now on the left here, you can see it looks okay, right? This flowering yucca looks pretty amazing, right? Uh, but it's not until you see the custom camera profile activated that you realize that you lost a lot of the blue saturation in the sky just by applying a camera profile uh, in the richness of the greens in the yucca leaves come through. Uh, but the, the stalks in here to me really didn't make sense until I did a custom white balance in addition to that. Now, I, I wrote it out here at the bottom because I, I wanted to make sure that everybody could feel the impact of this. The difference is subtle, but aren't the subtle differences why we practice and elevate our craft? Because we're the ones in the driver's seat, we're the ones making the decisions about how to present our final image. Uh, and all of those choices add up to something. And that is what you wanna present as your art, your craft or your product. 
So let's take a look at the nuts and bolts of this. If you were to apply a custom camera profile in Lightroom, you see where the, the pink box is here? It's This is where the profile Adobe Color is over to the right-hand side. That's where you click on those four boxes. And then in this drop-down profile browser, you're going to see profiles. And you'll see I've got 59 there. You won't have that many. It's because I create a lot of custom profiles. When you click on that, You'll see it says grid here. You're going to see a lot of boxes and then some small words underneath it. It might be hard to read that. So perhaps you click on grid and choose list instead. And then you'll just be able to read the profile names. Incidentally, you see how there's a star next to it? If you click on that star and it becomes a filled in star, it'll show up in your quick list, your drop down without having to go into the profile browser. So basically you go in here, you click on the custom profile that you made and you're done. Once you apply that, you're done. When you use each camera profile, I'm gonna say that if you're just starting out and you want a little boost of confidence, just make a single, that's gonna be confusing. Make a dual illuminant custom camera profile and apply it to all night photography situations. You'll immediately see better color in every situation. If you agree with me, or you have different color temperatures that you shoot at, then you can follow this sort of guideline. I wouldn't say this is a recipe or rule. 3850 Kelvin is where we shoot for dark skies. It makes the Milky Way look kind of neutral. Uh, so if you have a single luminant for that, it's gonna be slightly better than the dual luminant profile, which covers a broader range of color temperatures. Same goes for the 4200 Kelvin single luminant from we use that for moonlight and then 5600 kelvin i use all the way through twilight from sunset to all the way through the end of twilight until true dark and then i switch my camera over to 3850 and then i switch profiles of course so uh white balance i think this is the one of the last things that i haven't explained how do i get white balance from a color checker well the second white up is the same thing as the large white uh, white balance panel that you have there. So if you use the color picker in Lightroom on either of those, you're going to get a great white balance. So uh, once you do that, you'll see it pop into place and you'll see all these colors go where they should. And then you can proceed to make a creative edit from there. Um, you might not always use that and you'll find some situations where it doesn't improve the image. So you can just undo the white balance or set it to as shot instead. Uh, the profile, I'm just showing you a different way to look at it. During the edit, you can choose those presets that you have. Uh, you can choose a dual luminant or find a single luminant one and then begin your creative edits. But this is a more zoomed up view of what we were talking about, that part of the edit panel within Lightroom Classic. So custom camera profiles made with color checkers definitely gave me a better sense of what's going on. And once I applied the entire chain of color management to my workflow, my confidence increased greatly, knowing that my displays were always the same. They're the same brightness. They're the same contrast. They were the same colors. And then I brought in my images and applied custom camera profiles to them, knowing that they were starting from a place of consistency and color. My confidence in being able to embark on an edit where things weren't going to go haywire uh, just went through the roof all the way up to the stars. In fact, if you want me to make a bad joke. I want you to enjoy color. I know that this was a, a lot of talking and a lot of showing. I promised to talk to you about my workflow, and I did. I didn't show a lot of editing. I didn't show a lot of pictures here uh, because I promised to talk to you about my workflow. But I just want you to understand that as detailed as I get here, I do it so that you can understand the nuts and bolts of it. It's really not that hard. It is fun. And I think you'll enjoy your night photography a lot more. And I'm just going to do a quick recap so you can see it. During capture, shoot raw, shoot all of your lenses, and apply uh, the color temperature light and match that with your camera at 3800, 4200, and 5600 Kelvin. Import your RAW files. I use, I use DNG, you don't have to. Uh, this process will probably convert it to a DNG. And I use standard previews. You can build one-to-ones if you want. 
You should calibrate and profile your displays. If you're using BenQ, you should have a profiler, uh, a colorimeter from Calibrite, and you can use that with BenQ software. If you don't have a BenQ display, you might consider getting one because they're freaking awesome. Uh, and if you have just a laptop or a mini and another display, then you can use the Calibrite profiler and a, and a colorimeter to make sure that you're color managed there. You're going to create your camera profiles. Uh, and you start with a dual luminant one. If you like that, make your other three and start playing with those to apply at particular specific color temperatures. And then during post-processing, you're going to take those camera profiles and you're going to apply them to your images and possibly the white balance also, and then begin your creative edits from there. I hope this was inspiring. I hope that you understand a little bit more about uh, the color management chain uh, and what I do uh, to wrangle my color so that I can get to edits that make me thrilled when I'm done with them. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A now. I see a bunch of things going on there. So I'm just going to switch over to this camera so I can see you guys this way. Uh, and we're going to check in. Ali, how we doing? Uh, you're doing phenomenal. Lots of praise, lots of uh, really good engagement with everybody attending. Uh, some questions uh, from the get-go. Uh, let's start with Don. Uh, Don, you may have answered this, Matt, but Don wanted to know, does uh, Color Checker work with Capture One? Yes, it does. Uh, there's a workflow. I got to say that I'm not as familiar with that as I am with the Adobe workflow. Uh, I know that you can create an ICC profile with that, uh, but it doesn't include, of course, the Adobe DNG part of it. So um, we'll have to check uh, to see exactly how it can affect that. But I, I'm absolutely sure that you can create a profile from that. So. All righty. And uh, Tom says, <clears throat> Matt, you mentioned that you have two BenQ monitors. When you calibrate them, do they end up looking exactly the same or good enough? If they don't look the same, how do you know what is correct? Uh, they do end up looking the same every time. If they didn't, uh, I could use the software to to make them, to say this is the one uh, that, and I, okay, let me answer it. They, are, they do look the same every time I profile them. I profile them at the same time and they've been on for the same amount of time. Uh, and I drag my, Lightroom window between them with uh, with a color checker, just to see if I can notice a difference. Um, if I were in a situation where they weren't like that, I would see which one had the better um, profile report, their calibration report at the end, and I would match the other one to that using the software. Hope that helps. Awesome. And then uh, Dan. Uh, says, hi, Matt, I have a BenQ SW270C and a Display uh, Plus HL. Uh, BenQ tells me that the Palette Master Ultimate doesn't support the Display Plus HL yet. Do you know anything about it? Not specifically, uh, but if, uh, uh, Ali, are you going to be able to share the uh, Q&A report with me? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we can Wonderful. follow up with uh, Dan, I know uh, on our end we're you know we closely work with Calibrate, so that's uh, definitely high on the priority. Uh, yeah. Just can't give an ETA yet. Okay, well, we will. If you registered for this, chances are your email address is uh, with it, uh, and give us a week or two um, at, at most, and we'll try and get back to you on that. Uh, if not, leave a comment on the YouTube video. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, but leave a comment on the YouTube video and then we'll reply to you there. Awesome. And then uh, one of our good friends, Michael, who's always on the webinars, uh, Matt, he wants to know what your thought process was about choosing the 32-inch SW321C. Wow. Uh, I sit exactly three foot, three inches away from my display. <laughs> and I know because I just measured it because I was talking to my optometrist. Um, when I sit here, the field of view uh, is at the edges of my glasses. It's It might be a silly reason, but like that's exactly the size of my field of view uh, for my prescription lenses. Um, and I think for a lot of people, depending on the distance you put it at, 
it may feel like just the right amount of space that you can pay attention to. Um, uh, my 27 inch, uh, I could definitely is exactly within my, my perfect zone of focus, but 32 is this, but I'm, I'm kind of a mad scientist when it comes to multi-screening. I have three displays at the same time because uh, I use them all. Let's say if I'm editing video, I'll, you know, I'll keep, you know, the timeline over here and some other things like that. If I'm using Photoshop or Lightroom, I'll have multi-screens going at the same time. So sometimes you just want to have what you're looking at larger in front of your face. Um, and I just have to go back to saying it's, it's the exact same size as the field of view of my glasses. So hope that makes sense. And then, uh, Matt, knowing Michael, I know he's considered the new SW272U or Q model. Uh, what are your thoughts on the SW272U versus your 321C? I can't tell you which one I love more. The The 272U uh, is just an extraordinary display. Um, having the two side by side, uh, I feel just supremely lucky uh, to to have access to such fine displays. And I, I can't find anything critical to say about either of them. Um, and that's not because we're at a BenQ presentation. Um, I can't do my work without these. So I, I absolutely rely on them. If they weren't the right tool, I wouldn't be using them. Um, and I think that the, the contrast and sharpness um, and color fidelity of both displays thrill me. And I, the size of the display just might be something personal, you know, and it has a lot to do with your environment too. Good. And then uh, appreciate the kind words, Matt. And uh, Mike Davis wants to know, uh, can you send out a PDF with these instructions to the attendees? Uh, fantastic info and presentation style. Uh, thanks. Um, I hadn't considered that. Uh, let me chat with uh, Ali about this uh, and see what we can do. I normally don't post my um, my decks uh, that way, uh, but I have lately converted some of my decks into instructions that we share privately with our workshop attendees for national parks at night. Um, if there's uh, if there's some interest in this, I, I I think that the the YouTube video should be very helpful, but I can understand why a PDF would be helpful too. So let me consider how to do that, uh, and we'll, and we'll get back to you. Awesome, awesome. And then um, there's a, a question about uh, camera profiles. Can camera profiles be compared to other Capture One? Mm, I don't feel qualified to answer that. I'm sorry, uh, but we can we can get Calibrate involved and get you an answer. For sure. And then uh, Tim asked, can this be applied to daylight shooting as well? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I'm in the fortunate or unfortunate position of embarking on one of the hardest forms of photography that you can do. A low light, high ISO, uh, noise management all the time. Um, night photography stretches the limits of equipment and files. That, that come from that kind of photography to no end. This was created, the color checkers were created for daylight photography and they work like a charm for daylight photography. I Funny, funny short story is I first tried to use uh, color checkers for night photography, let's say six or seven, maybe eight years ago. And I didn't find a use case where they did work. And part of it was that how the tech how good the technology was at the time both cameras with high iso noise rendering and also leds leds were garbage uh not correct that's unfair the color fidelity of an led its spectral emission was not as good as it is now especially at low intensities where night photographers usually use them daylight photographers have it good their light sources are rich and full spectrum. Night photographers, we battle terrible things all the time and make the best of them. So if you're a daylight photographer and you put a color checker into your workflow, you're going to be delighted at how consistent everything gets. That's the end of that story. Yeah. Uh, and then, Matt, we have a, a hello from one of our friends. Art is in the chat and says hi. Hi, Art. 
I depend on you, buddy. Your information is the best. Absolutely. And he actually caught one of the questions earlier from Dan about the Display Pro HL. He says that it is supported in the new version of Palette Master Ult. You just have to select it in the dropdown. Fantastic. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Art. I appreciate you being here. And then uh, <clears throat> Dan had a follow-up question. Uh, do any of your steps change if you're using a camera with an Astro modified sensor? Funny thing? No. I mean, it's, it, it is exactly the same. Um, you might, if you're using a specific filter on an Astro modified camera, uh, I bet this is still going to work great for you, but I have not tried out all of the different kinds of spectrally limiting filters that are available for H alpha cameras or other Astro modified cameras. I have an H alpha modified. Uh, it's not a full spectrum, but I use a specific filter to get rid of the IR. Um, and it works great for me. It makes it makes my results look like a, standard spectrum camera plus the h alpha so in my use case um it works thrillingly great it takes all the frustration out of post-processing those things because just pops all the colors into the right place um sidebar to that i've had a couple of conversations with the uh, spencers about this and they're truly curious about it too and they saw the results and they said that's very promising so uh, i hope that helps you i want you to try it out Grab, grab a couple pictures of a color checker and run through this process. Um, and I, I bet you'll be thrilled. And Matt, let's take a few more questions because uh, you're getting a lot of good interest about the nitty gritty technical uh, details. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of questions about uh, x ray or data color products, uh, even though you're a mm -hmm. Calibrite ambassador. Uh, uh, Essentially, they're asking, uh, would all this work the same if they were using a, a data color Spider X calibrate? Honestly, I'm not qualified because I haven't used one. Um, uh, I've, I've had, and I, I don't, I hope I don't sound like a shill here, but because I'm not, uh, I've never had any reason to distrust X right or calibrate. Actually, I've been using these products since Monaco, which predates X right. So I've been using the same uh, chain of color technology for a long time. Um, however, having color management is 100% better than not having color management. Uh, so let's say if you used um, data color to profile and calibrate your displays, uh, you could still use a color checker to create camera profiles. Those two things are separate. Uh, they're applied separately. Uh, I hope that that gets closer to uh, revealing the kind of truth you're looking for. And then uh, Keith had an interesting question. Uh, have you experienced any problems with Mac OS uh, Ventura with color profiles and ICC profiles? Uh, he goes on to say, I cannot print correctly on Mac with my own created ICC profiles created on an i1 studio. I have not experienced that. Uh, but lately, I've been sending out all of my print work uh, to Bay Photo, uh, and I haven't, uh, I have my Pro 1000, I haven't turned it on for a month or two. Uh, so I haven't experienced what you're experiencing. But I bet if you reach out to the support team at Calibrite, uh, they can help you out. Or x if the if they're still, if the Spectro is, photometer is still on, on their end. Uh, but start with Calibrite and see what they say. Awesome, awesome. And then uh, our friend Michael had a follow-up question on you choosing the 321C. Mm -hmm. uh, he's asking if you have any issues with 4K at 32 inch inches. Uh, the only issue that I have is that I'm, I'm going to reveal this now. I shouldn't reveal this. I'm 47 and my eyes aren't getting any younger. Um, and sometimes the tools and Photoshop are, are really tiny. Um, or the tools in DaVinci Resolve or Lightroom. Uh, and every once in a while, I'll put it down to 2K uh, just so that my eyes uh, don't struggle as much. But that's me, and that's me being organic. If I move the display closer, uh, probably six to eight inches, 
uh, it would be less of an issue, but then I'd be turning my head a little bit more. Uh, so um, outside of that, zero issues using it at 4K. Okay, and then um, here's a photography question from Mike. Uh, what filter what filter holder are you using on your Z lenses? And is there an adapter to make a 150 millimeter filter holder fit the same smaller lens? I am currently, it's funny, I only use two filters. Uh, well, there's a, a filter I use for my H alpha modified camera that I don't count among them. I use a, a circular polarizer and neutral density filters. That's it. So I've switched over from using drop-in filters, which I used for 10, 20 years, uh, to using uh, magnetic uh, front, front of the lens filters. Uh, and I just started using a company called Earth, U-R-T-H. Um, and I love them. They're just, the magnets are strong. Prior to that, uh, I've used uh, Nisi, NISI. I've used Benro. Um, and the many manufacturers make many different filter holders, uh, and they all work pretty much the same. Uh, and normally, if you have a 150 millimeter filter holder, there are step down rings to get to the filter thread size that you need. That'll, that you can either have a special inset that's made for your specific filter or a step down from, let's say it's 120 millimeters for the sake of argument, to 77 or 82 or 87, whatever you need. Um, those shouldn't be hard uh, to source. But usually those 150 millimeter filter holders are to cover super wide angle lenses. Um, and they have a special holder for the front of those flower shaped lenses too. So I hope that was helpful. Um, uh, right now, I I did use internal camera filters for a little bit, um, but I very much prefer not taking my lenses off to get the filter out. So I switched to the magnetic front mount filters instead. And then, Matt, that looks like all the questions. Uh, a big shout out and a big thank you to Art. Art Swanson is in the uh, chat. He's uh, answering a lot of the calibration related questions specific to thank you. Uh, big shout out to Art, uh, but Matt, so many thank you, so many compliments uh, from everyone. Uh, Luann, uh, Jerry, Mike, Michael, Jay, just uh, lots of compliments to showering you with love. Uh, I think I think this is a, a good sign that maybe we need to do another one. I'd love to. Can I say my own thank yous? Absolutely. I'd like to thank you, Ali for uh, having me. Uh, thank you, especially for supporting me and supporting National Parks at Night. Uh, from the outset, uh, we really appreciate you guys believing in us uh, as we believe in you. And it, I would be remiss not to thank Calibrite. Uh, I, I've been working with them, whether they liked it or not, for a long time. <laughs> and and I, I was an x ray Colorado, uh, and I am an ex uh, Calibrite ambassador too. Um, because I believe in it and I believe in it because it works. So, um, I don't like superfl superfluous things. Uh, so uh, anything I put into my workflow are things that matter to me. Uh, so thank you to, for the support from Calibrate and thank you, Ben Q for, for helping us, uh, do what we do. Uh, you're, you're the window into our final edits and we appreciate you. So thank you. Beautifully put, Matt. Uh, again, uh, on behalf of BenQ, thank you so much. Thank you to Calibrate. Thank you to National Parks at Night. Uh, thank you, everyone who joined and all the remaining attendees for the Q&A. Uh, great presentation today, and we'll have the recording out tomorrow. And uh, yeah, good night, everyone. Peace. Thanks for coming. Appreciate you.